All right. Well, welcome everybody. Welcome to this Master Gardener in service. Um, I'm Jan Boglinger. I'm the Genesee County Master Gardener Coordinator. So because of the amount of calls we got last year on the helpline about gypsy moths, um, I've reached out to a couple people to give us some insight as to what we might expect this year. And one of them is uh, Gary Coplin. He is a forester with the New York State Department of Environmental Conservation. And Gary's going to give us a little bit of a background check on gypsy moss and also maybe some tips that we can help the public with when we start getting those calls this year. So um, I'm going to ask everybody to stay on mute. Gary is in an office setting today, so hopefully there won't be too much background stuff coming from his office, but we'll we'll do our best and um, We'll hold questions for the end so that we can keep the flow going well. And I will turn it over to Gary. Thank you, Jan, I appreciate it. Uh, yeah, so my name is Gary Copeland. I'm a forester with the DEC. Uh, specifically, I'm in private land services. Um, so I'm not one of the foresters that necessarily works on our state owned properties as much. Um, I actually work more directly with um, private landowners that have forested land, whether it be a few acres or a couple hundred or even a thousand acres, depending on, um, you know, what type of properties that you own for in uh, various objectives and reasons. Um, so it could be even industrial forest landowners um, that own it privately, but most of the landowners are probably in the neighborhood of 20 to 50 acres um, with a lot of exceptions in between. And some of it's for working in different programs, some of it's working on specific items. And one of those specific items that's come up a lot in the last year, really starting two or three years ago, we started getting calls on gypsy moth. Um, I think it was about the summer of 2018, we got quite a few calls on gypsy moth and it was a peculiar case. It was happening on blue spruce, Colorado blue spruce, blue spruce, sorry, um, in people's backyards, front yards, ornamental trees, basically. Um, and that was odd because gypsy moth is not typically known or historically known to hit hard on uh, spruce trees or conifers in general. Um, so that's a, a kind of a whole nother story that uh, we'll get into as we go along, but that's kind of the background. We started getting those calls in 2018, then again in 2019. Then in the winter of 2019, we started noticing egg masses all over the place in the woods that I visit. And I, I work in Monroe County, Genesee County, Orleans County, and Wayne County. Um, and I have colleagues and coworkers that are working in, in other counties throughout the state as well. Um, so my other colleague, Bryce June, um, was in the starting to notice around the same time problems in Ontario County, Seneca um, and uh, Livingston, mostly Ontario County. And that's probably, if you've, if you've heard about gypsy moth in the news or read about it in the news, you're probably hearing about how bad it is in Ontario County. Uh, particularly from Naples on up into Canandaigua. Um, and it is bad there, but it's bad in many other places. It's just that in that, that stretch of the Bristol Hills Valley area, that's a lot of oak and oak is their favorite of all species to eat. And uh, so you have large contiguous forested acres getting defoliated by gypsy moth caterpillars all at the same time. So it had an additional shock value. Um, so it's not that it's not bad anywhere else. It's just that there's a lot more concentrated oak and a lot more visible damage there. So without you know, further going into that, I'd like to start our, our discussion on gypsy moth. Um, and I'll start kind of from the life cycle and work our way up to management options and what we could do um, to kind of help landowners, friends, ourselves uh, dealing with gypsy moth issues. And just a quick, I would just like to say hello to everyone that I that I know or I'm just meeting for the first time, uh, especially folks that I've worked with in the past. Um, you know, I thank you also because uh, you're also out there helping and assisting landowners that I know and work with. And, and some of them are good friends that get advice from you as master gardeners or just assistance from the Cornell Cooperative Extension there at Batavia. So um, that, that's a huge help, not just uh, directly related to this job in forestry, but also um, just in general for folks, um, you know, inquiring about plants, um, the natural environment and gardening, of course. So gypsy moth life cycle is broken down into four basic stages. 
Uh, for the majority of their lifetime, uh, they are in a dormant stage and are in the form of egg masses attached to trees and other animate and inanimate objects. Um, and then somewhere in early May, late April, uh, the eggs hatch. They go through uh, several instars or different stages where uh, the caterpillars molt and become progressively larger, change slightly in appearance. Uh, then there is the pupation phase uh, where uh, like all other moss and caterpillars, they go through metamorphosis and then become the adult moss themselves. The adult moss um, don't do much anything but fly around, mate and reproduce for uh, the continuation of the species. And uh, once the female lays her eggs, um, the cycle begins all over again uh, from dormancy in uh, mid to late August, all the way through again until they hatch in the following April or May. Um, something that I, I've been particularly fascinated by um, and I'm learning a lot um, over the last couple of years about is the growing degree dates. And I, I'm familiar that uh, for gardeners, this is a big thing. Um, also for, for people in agriculture and entomology um, and various other uh, sciences, growing degree days is a really, really helpful way of being able to forecast the development of plants, insects, and their interrelation. In this case, gypsy moth and its relations with the host species. And uh, my biggest concerns being um, you know, tree species, but uh, there are some shrub species that gypsy moth also affect. And, um, there's uh, various species of trees being ornamental or natural species that we find in our forests. But I believe there's about 300 different species in North America that gypsy moth can feed on. And then there's probably about uh, a dozen or so that are particular favorites. Um, but once you know the, the growing degree days for the development of gypsy moth, it helps a lot with forecasting and knowing when to be prepared for what time of year to be ready to apply different types of management techniques. And for instance, about after about 571 degree uh, growing degree, um, yeah, 571 degrees Fahrenheit growing degree days, uh, we know that gypsy moth is going to hatch. And, you know, for us, that's somewhere in late April, early May. Um, and so if we're gonna do any egg mass uh, scraping, scraping off the trees or oiling, we know we gotta get it done before then. After that, we have to employ a different management or you know, try a different approach altogether. So the caterpillars are in, they start immediately after hatch. Um, the larvae are gonna be particularly tiny and not too harmful in the beginning and they will get progressively more harmful as they molt, age and grow in size. Um, there's about five to six instars involved with gypsy moth. Uh, I guess the females really only go through six instars. They have more developmental needs, um, uh, considering that they're going to eventually lay eggs and um, all the other complications that uh, they'll need more energy to produce um, and to fulfill their part of the life cycle than the males. Um, so a lot of the males only go through five instars. Um, some of the distinguishing features are, are really differentiated between the first and second instar. During the first instar, when the, when the caterpillars are very, very small, um, to the naked eye, they look mostly dark black and a little bit fuzzy. Um, during that second instar is when they start to develop the characteristic colors and hairiness and some of those other um, distinguishing features that are not going to change too much as the other instars come along. Um, and this is gonna take place over about seven weeks, I believe. Um, and each time uh, the caterpillars molt, uh, they'll shed their skin or outer covering and that allows them to grow into the next size and next stage class. And they'll become more and more noticeable with time. So a lot of times um, when we're out there, we're not, we're not seeing them even though they're very active and around us because they're so small and because they're not doing a lot of damage in the beginning. So a lot of times you might not notice them much or might not hear about them much in their first, second, even third instar. But by the fourth, fifth, and sixth instar, that's usually when we're hearing about them, seeing them and seeing the damage um, and the problems that they cause. I've already kind of talked about that a little bit, but uh, there's a little bit more detail listed here on this next page. Uh, first, second, third instars. Um, some of the things I think to keep in mind are um, the fact uh, that the caterpillars kind of behave differently. 
uh, during these early instars, they're feeding pretty much day and night from my understanding. And when they first hatch, they ascend to the top of the tree um, that they're on or nearest to. Um, so they might hatch on a rock and then find their way to a tree. And if it's a desirable tree, they might stay on the tree. If it is not a tree of uh, their host liking, uh, they're more apt to kind of uh, find their way to another tree. And one of the ways they do that is, it may be incidental, it may be purposeful, but they call it ballooning. And what it is, is the insect there is a caterpillar crawls down a silken line from the, from the first highest point it ascends to. And then the wind may grab it and rip that silk right off the tree. Um, so they become airborne. They're kind of like little airborne troopers. Um, and again, I'm not positive on if, how much of that's purposeful and how much of that's incidental, but it happens regardless. Um, so sometimes this means that they just uh, go from one tree to the next, sometimes it's more. Um, the timing of the hatch and that first caterpillar stage is pretty important. Uh, it'll vary a little bit from species to species because the buds are unfolding for certain species at different times of the year. Oaks tend to be a little bit later than maple or, or some other species. So, um, you know, the, the caterpillars might start off on one species and move to another. Um, if they're developing a little bit late, that could be problematic for the, for the caterpillar. It could be good for the tree. Uh, if they develop a little early, it could be catastrophic for the caterpillar because they, they could run up starving to death. Um, but their evolutionary background um, has adjusted them well. So it's usually not, their timing is not very off, even when it is off by a day or two, they're usually able to persist uh, until there is food available and until they're able to take it in and feed on it. So that timing is pretty crucial. Um, and it's the only reason that these caterpillars can survive here is because their timing works out pretty well um, with the timing of our species. Um, having said that, I, uh, I forgot that I didn't discuss the beginning part of gypsy moss. Gypsy moss are non-native species. Uh, the particular variety that we're dealing with is the European gypsy moth, not the Asian or Japanese gypsy moth. That's an entirely uh, worse predator or worse uh, invasive, very similar, but they have some distinguishing features and traits. We're dealing with the European gypsy moth that was brought here in the late 1800, or late 1800s. It was accidentally released and subsequently became a pretty regular problem in Massachusetts, then Connecticut, parts of Jersey, uh, northeastern Pennsylvania, southeastern New York, and other parts of that New England area, the tri-state area, and has progressively moved outward from there. Um, now we're, we're just dealing with it uh, occasionally now, but uh, parts of Massachusetts and Connecticut have been dealing with it since the late 1800s. Um, another thing about this early instar stage of the caterpillars is they, they tend to feed somewhere towards the center of the leaf blade. Um, they start, so the early damage will be uh, small holes in the leaf blade and they'll, they'll be relatively unnoticeable compared to later on. And, uh, and I believe in the next slide, we'll see that. Yeah, so in this next slide, we're talking about fourth, fifth, and sixth in the star caterpillars. These guys are getting much larger. Uh, their distinguishing features become much more abrupt. Um, one way to tell a, a gypsy moth caterpillar from say a forest tent or an Eastern tent caterpillar, which are both native species um, to our area um, and very common in some other species, uh, some other tussock moth species. Uh, gypsy moth kind of falls into the tussock moth group. Um, so it's there, all the tussocks are kind of hairy. Um, so it's pretty easy to um, mess up with the identification in the early phases of their uh, larval instars. As they get larger, they become pretty distinguishable. As you can see in this picture here, if you can see it clearly, there's rows of dots um, on the back of the, the gypsy moth caterpillar. And uh, we usually have this uh, set of six red dots and a set of four blue dots. Um, and then obviously the, the caterpillar is quite hairy as well. Um, one thing I should note about those hairs is anyone handling this insect um, should be kind of aware that some people are more sensitive to others in reactions to those hairs. They have um, a chemical that the body uh, uh, exudes that um, can cause a, a irritant type reaction in some people. And most people, it's very, very minor. 
Uh, there might be the occasional person that has a, a more severe reaction and, and develops a pretty good rash. I haven't heard much more severe than that, but um, I'm not positive if it's if it's possible for anybody to have a really severe reaction or not. But some people will definitely develop a little bit of rash. Um, others may not see anything, even if they're handling it quite often. Something to keep in mind if you're out there working with this insect, uh, trying to remove it from trees or handling it in the identification process. Any of these tussock type moths have these chemicals and can cause this kind of irritant. It's the same kind of irritant that makes them difficult to digest and handle uh, from predators, which is another reason that they become such strong invasive characters in our landscape. Um, those hairs make it difficult for them to be digested or even eaten by a lot of birds, uh, small mammals and other prey that will overlook them because of that. Uh, another important factor about uh, these late in star stages that I'll get into when we start talking about management is the fact that these caterpillars, unless they're under extraordinary pressure, which they can be in, in severe outbreaks, they will do most of their feeding at night. Um, during the daylight hours, they, for whatever reason, whether it's heat or this actual solar radiation or predation, they tend to hide and find shady cooler areas. Uh, in the forest, they're going to go down to the forest floor and hide under debris, woody debris on the ground, sticks and stuff like that. Um, if they're in yards or urban areas, they're going to, they might find uh, bird boxes, bird vests, um, pools, the undersides of decks, uh, cars, vehicles. Hence, one of the reasons that uh, gypsy moths are also often uh, unintentionally um, dispersed throughout the country um, because they wind up on boats, trailers, cars, and then unintentionally brought from one location to the next. So that's going to be an important factor later on when we discuss management techniques. They do go down from the trees and find shady spots, not all of them, and not as many when times are really bad when we have outbreaks because the competition factor keeps them feeding as long as possible so that they don't run out of food. But times when the populations are growing and um, before they reach outbreak levels, this could be a really helpful thing to know as the caterpillars descend the trees and head down to the ground, they become easier to catch. And we'll talk about that in a moment. Another thing you'll, you'll notice in that second picture on the slide is that the, the larger larvae and these later instars are gonna start feeding from the outside of the leaf for the leaf margin and move inward. Um, so that's gonna show up as a lot more damage. You're gonna start to see leaves getting, if there's a lot of feeding going on, you're gonna start to see leaves getting decimated in this fourth, fifth, and this sixth instar. And so with the instars, there's often about a seven to 10 day period between each instar, or during each instar, I should say. So by the time we're getting into the fourth, we're already talking about a month into the hatch. And if, if the hatch is say around May 1st, um, we're going to be talking around June 1st or the first week of June when you start seeing noticeable damage. Um, that's the kind of damage that you might see from a distance. Um, you might notice damage if you're looking up close, but um, for most of us um, going about our daily business, we'll probably not notice it much until at least June and quite possibly later than June. Pupation. This is kind of the, the neat story for all insects. Um, uh, so all, all moths and caterpillars uh, that uh, transform to either moth or uh, butterfly go through a metamorphosis period where they pupate. Um, we talk about cocoons and, and technically the cocoon phase is um, the earliest phase of uh, pupation where they wrap silk around their bodies and enclose themselves in what will become a pupal chamber. So this rather ugly looking thing um, in the picture below are two different pupil chambers. It's past the cocoon phase and uh, the caterpillars have wrapped themselves up and developed these pupil chambers, which they're now actively undergoing a metamorphosis from caterpillar to moth. Uh, the smaller ones uh, are the noticeably smaller ones are typically the males. Um, the larger ones will, will be the females. And this is going to kind of correspond with the larger female moth uh, body size and the smaller uh, male moth body size. So that is one way if you need to tell them apart. Sorry about that. I 
apologize about that interruption. Um, my technology skills are a little bit lacking in some cases. So um, anyway, uh, during pupation, they're, they're technically not dormant. Their the bodies are changing, but they're not having any influence on their environment. For about two weeks, they kind of go, you know, relatively quiet. It's not exactly true because there's a lot of other insects in the population that are at different phases. So while many of the gypsy moth are in their pupation phase, some will still be in their larval phase or caterpillar phase, and others will be moving into the next phase or the adult hunt phase. And uh, so here's some pictures on this slide of uh, what your adults look like. Uh, the female will be noticeably larger, uh, have a significantly different color, it'll be bright white. Their heads and neck and chest area have a noticeable uh, furry, hairy coating to them that will really make them stand out. Uh, they, the females especially have a pretty neat looking pair of antennae. Um, and when they're standing straight up and looking in the direction that you are, they look particularly weird and, and, and alien. Like um, uh, So though they're pretty moth, like a lot of invasive insects are, they're unique in, in uh, interesting and, and often thought of as is, uh, uniquely beautiful. Um, unfortunately, the, that beauty uh, kind of fades when you're tucking. Apologize again. Okay. More gypsy moth calls. Um, so during, uh, during the adulthood, the moths are basically, um, they have one job and that is to find one another uh, to mate and procreate. Um, and the female moth actually, the female European gypsy moth, and this is a big difference between the female European gypsy moth and the female Asian or Japanese gypsy moth is that the female European gypsy moth does not fly. Um, that gives us a lot of advantage compared to the potential of the female flying uh, because a female being uh, non-flight is dependent on wind dispersal um, for her young uh, hatchlings the following year. So she can't fly to new areas and spread the population, fortunately for us. It's more likely that people will disperse her or that um, will disperse the egg mass that she lays or the wind will disperse her hatchlings the following year. Uh, the males fly like crazy, but they're completely focused on finding the, fer or the, um, the females, and they're doing that by searching out the pheromones that females uh, lay out. Um, these egg masses that they lay, the female lays these egg masses that are described as buff color. Um, I never knew that buff was a color until I started researching in gypsy moss. Uh, but that uh, creamy tan brown coloration is, is pretty common for a fresh gypsy moth egg mass. Um, the egg mass can have anywhere from 100 to about 1,000, even 1,200 or more eggs. I guess the average is in the neighborhood of four to 500 eggs per egg mass. And so she's, as she lays the egg mass on the surface that she decides upon, you know, it could be a typical host tree like an oak, or it could be a rock or, or birdhouse or just about anything. She adheres her eggs to the surface in rows and I believe layers them. Uh, as she's putting them down, she's also pulling hairs from her chest and pressing those into and protecting the actual eggs themselves. So the egg mass is a collection of individual eggs and uh, the, the adhesive and the protective hairs. It's kind of interesting is uh, while I was, I was kind of exploring the summer on ways to get rid of egg masses, I actually played around with uh, using a propane, a small hand propane torch. Um, what I found is you could place the uh, a flame to one of those egg masses on a tree for several seconds, um, burn the outer egg masses, and then scrape away the outer portions that are become burnt and basically carbon. Um, and find that the inner egg is inner eggs are, are look at least appear to be untouched. Um, so I, I assume that the egg uh, adhesives or the actual hairs and egg masses act almost like a, um, a fire retardant coating. I'm sure that's not what their purpose is. It's probably more to do with insulation, but it seems to have that impact too, which is oddly interesting, I think. Um, that's about all I have on this slide. I think we can move on to the next one. 
All right, so methods for treatment. Um, far and away, the most revered treatment that I hear about from arborists and uh, forest entomologists uh, protecting forests from gypsy moss is uh, biological pesticides applied from the air um, or applied from the ground with a foliar application when you're talking about smaller trees and in uh, landscape settings, homeowner settings, um, uh, building development settings, um, urban settings. Uh, but for forest settings, most of that's done by aerial application from a plane that's usually outfitted like a crop duster or a helicopter designed uh, and using nozzles to uh, uh, basically uh, volatilize the, the chemical application. And uh, BTK is the, is the main product that's used out there today. Um, there's a lot of different companies that produce it, but it's uh, Bacillus thuringiensis and a particular variety of that I believe, I don't want to mispronounce this, I believe, but I believe it's Kurosati or Kurosati. Um, that is the variety that works well for a forest environment. Um, Bacillus thuringiensis is probably sounds familiar to a lot of folks that um, work in gardening or the egg industry because it's used for, uh, it's labeled and used for a wide variety of different pests, um, particularly garden and egg pests. BTK in particular is labeled and used for forests and individual trees, whether ornamental or yard trees. Um, and probably in some cases orchards as well. Um, so most important thing you could ever say about pesticides is follow the label. Um, the label in New York State is the contract. In most states, the label is the contract. Um, there are some BTK products that are labeled registered for New York and unrestricted in New York. So that means that a homeowner can actually purchase some BTK products, apply it themselves. And from what I'm told, that could work pretty well uh, for foliar application on trees uh, up to about 15 feet in height. You could get a, um, a basic sprayer type uh, pump sprayer, or you know, it could even be a mechanized uh, sprayer with a um, uh, battery engine, um, a battery electronic engine to kind of uh, pressure um, a large container like off the back of a four wheel or UTV or vehicle. Uh, that could be purchased from some stores as well. Uh, so I do know some people that do that themselves on their own properties for a variety of different applications, uh, BTK um, spraying being one of them. Um, and then of course, uh, arborists have a little bit uh, more sophisticated equipment that could cover trees even higher. But once you start getting outside the, or above the 25 to 30 foot range in tree, um, it becomes more and more unfeasible, more expensive, more difficult, and there becomes more of a threat of um, unintended uh, uh, dispersant of the pesticide off the property. So it becomes uh, a potential problem um, during the application process. BTK is, is one of many options that are out there. Um, there's actually one or two other um, uh, organic pesticides uh, that are applied that are also uh, naturally occurring products that are um, uh, formulated into uh, a pesticide type product. Um, so they're naturally occurring. BTK just happens to be a bacterium that's naturally occurring in our soils. It's concentrated and then formulated into uh, various different uh, companies produce it uh, to be sprayed aerially or fo foliarly um, from the ground. Um, there's others that use different um, hormones or um, different, uh, uh, like for instance, one is a uh, virus um, that is produced um, in gypsy moth populations. Um, it's, it's produced only by the US Forest Service. It's called GypCheck. Um, it's found naturally occurring in gypsy moth populations when they become overabundant and start to crash. Uh, but it has, it has to be produced by actually collecting dead and dying gypsy moth carcasses. Um, so you can imagine just how labor intensive and expensive it is to produce. It's not regularly found out there and it's difficult to acquire. But there's several of these pro products that are, are organic, um, naturally occurring, and uh, some are available, some are uh, unrestricted, and some are restricted. Uh, there's also some other uh, chemical and non-organic products. Um, some that are systemic, some of that are contact uh, treatments. Um, and one really excellent webpage that I found online, I think would be easiest to, 
if you wanted to explore the different types of pesticides for application for gypsy moss is uh, this one here from Purdue University Extension. It's pretty excellent. It not only goes through the different types uh, of applications, it also goes kind of through the timelines of when they need to be applied, how they're applied, and to what phase of gypsy moth they can be applied to. So if you miss a window with one application like BTK, which has to be applied while the leaves are first coming out in spring, uh, the leaves have to absorb the BTK and then the caterpillar has to consume the BTK in order for it to work. If you miss that phase, there are other treatments that can be applied later in the year. So that kind of stuff's important to know and it all kind of goes along with that growing degree, uh, growing degree day model. Um, which is pretty helpful when predicting forecasting and determining management if you uh, decide you need to treat and manage gypsy moss on your property or your trees. Um, some other methods that have been proven uh, to one degree or another effective against gypsy moth over time since uh, the beginning of introduction here in the United States uh, going back into the late 1880s I believe was the first time that Massachusetts started having issues um, and that has really never stopped. Um, Massachusetts and Connecticut were some of the first areas, uh, first states to experience problems and they started um, deploying different tactics to uh, capture gypsy moths when they were vulnerable. And like I mentioned earlier, the late instar gypsy moth uh, caterpillars, uh, you know, after the third instar, so third, fourth, fifth, and uh, sixth instars for the females, they tend to descend down the tree trunks. Um, so uh, deploying a like stippy, uh, sticky type trap, uh, trap like this where a material like burlap or tin foil or plastic is wrapped around the tree and then either a home product like Vaseline or some other sticky substance is applied to that, uh, captures the, the gypsy moth caterpillar as it crawls over it. Um, there's also some products on the market that are designed for this. Uh, most will tell you not to apply directly to a tree because the tree bark can absorb the material into the tree and some of it could be toxic to the tree. So they usually suggest putting it on a burlap or other material designed for this uh, type of operation. So now this isn't going to catch every gypsy moth. Not every gypsy moth descends trees and I guess uh, that's never more true than we have an outbreak population like we do now because of the severe competition for the leaves on the trees, uh, the gypsy moss realize that competition and they don't stop feeding when things are really bad, uh, which means not many will descend the trunks if you're in a severe um, uh, area where the gypsy moth population is skyrocketing. Um, but in areas where it is not skyrocketing, this will become more common where the gypsy moth will descend the trunk and will be more likely to be caught up in a sticky trap or a burlap band. Um, if you look at the bottom left photo in this, uh, in this slide here, you can see someone that's deployed a, a, burlap, a burlap banding around a tree. And all they did is they took a sheet of burlap and used a string or something, uh, some kind of cord or tape to tie it to the tree about halfway like that. It allows the burlap to fold down over itself. And what happens is when those caterpillars are descending the tree to find shade and protection, they find it very conveniently within that burlap. And that's uh, extremely convenient if that's in your backyard or an area you could easily access. You can simply go there, collect, scrape those gypsy moss into a can and uh, soak in soapy water for a while until they expire. Um, obviously that's pretty time consuming labor intensive, but it's something that deployed in combination with perhaps a sticky trap can be pretty effective, especially when populations are low and you're dealing with a small number of trees. So it might be a very good tactic for um, a person with one or two trees in a yard, perhaps even more than one or two trees, but it just takes time um, and some patience. Um, over here to the, the right side of this slide, it shows a, it shows a spray bottle being uh, uh, applied and something projecting onto the egg masses. So this is something that's effective uh, basically right up until egg hatch. Um, usually some kind of dormant oil is applied. It's got to have the right viscosity, but what it is is the oil, once uh, soaking uh, in egg mass like this, a gypsy moth egg mass, so it's during its dormant season, sometime from mid-August right up through to late April, um, the oil is applied to the egg mass, and if it's applied correctly and coats the entire surface of the egg mass, it will uh, basically disturb the, the oxygen um, 
uh, that would normally pass through the, the membrane into the eggs. Um, so those little larvae that are dormant inside the eggs are actually respirating and without that oxygen, they will die. Um, so this is the same premises that works for dormant oiling and uh, oiling of egg masses of uh, various other pests. Um, the key is to, to obviously catching them during the dormant phase um, and then applying that oil uh, thoroughly enough that it covers most of the eggs and egg mass itself. Um, that can work pretty effective, but as you can imagine, uh, you can only spray up so high with a hand sprayer. And um, even with uh, more powerful sprayers from the ground, you start to lose accuracy and your ability to cover egg masses that are higher in the tree. Uh, if you look around in the forest when there's gypsy moth egg masses around, you'll notice that a higher percentage of them tend to be above 20 or 30 feet than below 20 or 30 feet. So um, unfortunately, it's very difficult to cover the majority of egg masses, no matter how much time you spend out there, unless you were to actually climb the trees and spray them individually. So this this kind of, these kind of treatments are a little bit more effective when you're working with smaller trees, yard trees, um, trees that don't tend to grow as tall as they do in the forest because of the open light and open growth form of the tree. Um, they can be much more effective in urban and suburban uh, areas around residences and ornamental trees that are smaller in nature. Um, some more hands-on treatment talk. Um, there's a couple other hands-on treatment ideas that are out there. Um, most, when you read about them, they describe them as being relatively ineffective. Uh, some people kind of push them off to the side altogether. I don't know what the, the truth is about it. Um, just to take another step back and give you my background, uh, gypsy moth has been something that I learned about in school. And um, you know, I graduated from college in 2006. So from 2004 to 2006, I was, I was working part-time as a forest technician and going to school. And that's the start of my career. And I've been it ever since till now. So um, although I've been doing this for 14, 15 years now, um, gypsy moth hasn't been a problem in our area. It's, it's here, um, it's always part of our environment. Occasionally, it'll be an issue for a tree or two, and, and once in a while, there'll be an oddball flare of it. Um, but we haven't had an outbreak in Western New York with gypsy moths since uh, I'm told about the mid to late 1980s. It's been a long time, and most of the folks that were dealing with it then have since retired. Um, and trying to find information for, from uh, different people that were professionals in natural resources at the time has actually been quite difficult at least here in Western New York. Uh, it's a different matter when you go into New England. Um, there's a lot of people that are dealing with this annually someplace in New England, and uh, they're on a cycle of eight to 12 years or so when they have a, an outbreak um, to levels that it can be damaging to the forest or street trees. Um, right now, I guess we're not in a true cycle yet, um, and hopefully we never become but this is the first major outbreak in a really long time. So a lot of us don't know what to expect, including myself. So getting back to the slide, um, I'm not convinced that uh, these hands-on treatments like uh, burlap banding, uh, sticky banding, uh, scraping of egg masses, and by the way, scraping the egg masses works best if you do it into a can of soapy water. Um, I think scraping the egg masses onto the ground can be effective too, but um, I'm told that egg masses that fall into the ground can technically survive and hatch. Um, but again, getting back to hands-on treatments, I believe that there's a possibility that the right combination and um, being diligent with them can be effective even when numbers are high. Um, most of what I'm reading suggests otherwise, and I don't have the experience to argue that. I just know that a lot of times, um, you know, uh, treatments of this, this sort when, you know, whether it's in, the, in your garden or in your yard, um, when you're dealing with an insect pest like Japanese beetles, say, it's hard to keep up with that kind of management. You know, if you're out there picking Japanese beetles from your bean plants, for instance, um, a day or two of that is doable. Um, you start talking about weeks, it becomes tiring. Um, you start losing patience. If you're not totally dedicated to your garden, you wind up just saying, oh, well, I'm just gonna let it do its thing. Um, I have a feeling it's the same way with gypsy moth. If you were to stay on top of it and stay diligent, I believe that it probably can be effective even during outbreaks. Again, I'm 
just cautiously optimistic. I, I tend to, I want to think that this, this can work. Though you'll, what you'll read in um, most documents, um, most literature and uh, fact sheets and stuff that you can find online, most of them say it's pretty ineffective. Um, but I, I, I'm being willing to bet, especially if you kind of worked in groups, um, neighbors, um, volunteers um, in community forests, parks um, around the house. Um, I think if you could scale that out to more than just a few trees at a time, um, and started scaling it out on the neighbor level and a landscape level um, where there's a persistent approach to managing these things, I think it could be pretty effective. Um, I'd be interested to see what happens. Uh, this is gonna be the second year of our infestation in Western New York and Western Finger Lakes. And I don't know if anyone's been doing this um, in a religious manner as far as sticking with it and preparing and following through on all these different techniques. Uh, but I know, like, for instance, the Canandaigua watershed is going to be holding a couple of uh, gypsy moth egg mess uh, scraping events uh, for people in the towns in the watershed uh, over the next coming weeks. So there's, a, there's some active efforts going on right now to kind of engage people and try this stuff. Um, real quick, natural dispersion, um, ballooning. I, I thought this, uh, this picture was, was a really good way of kind of... Um, imagining how this works. Um, and I didn't really learn too much about it until I spoke to an aerial applicator a couple of weeks ago. And he described to me that, you know, um, one reason that a lot of people kind of poo poo the whole, um, you know, hands-on approach is that uh, no matter what you do to your trees at the time, as far as getting rid of egg masses and caterpillars, these things can balloon in. And that's where the caterpillar is descending its own silken thread and breaks off in the wind. Um, I guess the longer the thread um, and the smaller the caterpillar at the time, uh, the more likely it is to drift and carry longer distances. Um, but having said that, I, I really do feel there's a huge variability in um, location to location and year to year on how effective ballooning really is. Uh, as you can imagine, it's dependent upon wind, just as uh, anyone that does hot air balloons would be too, or they have to really plan out um, their flight patterns. And obviously uh, caterpillars are not planning out flight patterns, but um, I don't know if they're more active and likely to balloon at, on particular days. Like, are they more active on windy days or calm days? That's stuff I, I'm still, completely oblivious to, I'm very interested in though. Um, most of the time our winds here are, are moving to the north and west, um, but obviously that's uh, that can be swirling in area to area and day to day. We, if you get a nor'easter and they're descending, I suppose they could wind up uh, moving to the south of the tree, um, or southwest of the tree uh, from which they originated. So I, in I'm really interested to find out how that actually works. And I've got it in the back of my head that I'm, I'm gonna climb up trees coming up in June <laughs> and just so I could see them when they're really small and see what's really going on. Um, it's hard to even find pictures of this stuff. Um, so I don't think it's well documented and uh, I could be wrong about this. I don't know how well studied it is. Uh, I've seen more studies and more information about um, actual um, spiders that do this um, and some other caterpillars or lepidoptera species. But gypsy moth, I haven't heard too much about. And I think this is a pretty interesting point and thing to understand with gypsy moth uh, dispersion. Real quick, unnatural dispersion is more related to human activities. Uh, this is uh, gypsy moths being accidentally moved in, in um, caterpillar form when they land in the back of a truck and you, and you take it out for the weekend or you travel on the weekend or when the egg masses are laid on things like uh, um, in bed, Gypsy moth ears, they could be laid on the sides of vehicles, uh, the rusty parts of trailers, very similar to spider lanternfly if you're following spider lanternfly issues. Um, very similar in nature to spider lanternfly. Uh, the females lay egg masses on a lot of different things. They're very um, resourceful in that manner. And the egg masses can be then transported um, unintentionally um, on the back of someone's boat, uh, truck trailer, uh, so commercial or recreationally, um, on firewood, on just about anything you can imagine. Anything that their egg mass gets laid onto and gets moved can then potentially spread it. So we know for sure that uh, gypsy moth has been moving across the country, um, both naturally and unnaturally. 
Um, and uh, if you look at the two different maps uh, above, you know, the U.S. Forest Service has been working across the country for a long time on spreading the word and reducing the spread, similar to the um, earlier operations with uh, uh, slow the spread or SLAM for uh, EAB. Um, unfortunately, that didn't work out great, but I think we slowed it down, but um, obviously that's gone far, far outside its, its origin in Lansing, Michigan. Uh, to most of the United States now. Um, similar process with gypsy moth, it doesn't seem to spread quite as fast, but um, it has, you know, gotten throughout the Great Lakes states now and most of the Northeast, but it's possible that it could, um, it can inhabit areas to the south and further west because it has the right trees and host species. So it's something to keep in mind too, that we, uh, we don't want to just manage this insect. We want to we help prevent it from ever needing to be managed in other parts of the country as well. Uh, for further information sources, um, I believe all this will be available online. You could, um, Jan could um, point us to that again later in this presentation. Um, there's several really good information sources out there, and I'd definitely like to point out to uh, the New York State DEC's webpage there at the top. Um, for anyone interested, uh, there's a really good um, PowerPoint presentation and other information on conducting egg mass surveys. Um, egg mass surveys are probably more effective when uh, managing gypsy moth in forested settings, uh, but there is instructions for how to carry them out in community and urban forests. Um, so that, that can be applied in that setting. Uh, for homeowners and a tree by tree basis, uh, it's difficult to kind of base um, whether or not to treat a tree by the number of egg masses. Um, it gets a lot more difficult and you got to be a little bit more intuitive uh, based on my conversations with arborists. Um, sometimes, you know, you might not have many egg masses on an individual tree, but you might have them in surrounding yards. Um, and you have to discuss the cost benefit analysis on that with um, the individuals that are concerned about protecting that tree comes down to species um, and knowing whether or not that species of tree is on their favorite list. Um, real quick, you know, uh, gypsy moth tends to favor oaks, all oak species. Um, uh, most, of the, most of the tree species referred to as poplar, which is uh, aspen, cottonwoods, uh, sometimes willows are referred to poplars, um, beech, basswood, um, several species of birch are amongst the favorites. Um, most of the maples are in a secondary category, uh, black cherries, um, a secondary category. Um, Let's see what other species, apple. Um, so sometimes uh, non-native varieties of species too are more delectable and that's a little bit harder to predict which ones are, are their favorites. But there are up to 300 species, I guess, in North America growing that could be attacked by gypsy moth. Um, uh, eyeball one is the Colorado blue spruce. That was, um, it was, that's something that's been documented over the last decade or so, uh, but it's still, it's still kind of new to a lot of people. and. Uh, we're finding that in our area, in particular, the greater Rochester area, we found that that has been a very real thing the last few years. Um, sometimes we'll find gypsy moth that attack blue spruce first and then disperse to other species. And we don't know why. There's been some discussions with this uh, throughout different entomologists around the country, including Cornell. And they say that the European gypsy moth that's hitting the blue spruce is the exact same variety and species as the, the European gypsy moth that hits oak. Um, so, so conifers are not off the list entirely. And obviously blue spruce is very much on the list, but um, usually um, in most cases, gypsy moth is going to attack broadleaf uh, uh, hardwoods, deciduous hardwoods first. Um, but they will also attack pines, firs, spruce, hemlocks. They just don't usually do so until they're running out of options. And the heavier the outbreak, the more likely you are to see them attacking conifers sooner and harder. Um, one of the really big downsides about conifers being attacked by gypsy moss is conifers store a lot more energy in their needles. Uh, so in their leaves compared to deciduous hardwoods, which, which store a lot of their carbohydrates in the form of starch in different cells throughout the tree trunk and tree root system so that when um, a hardwood tree is defoliated like an oak tree um, 
not as much energy is lost in the leaf itself. They're able to take energy from other parts of the tree and then refoliate after severe defoliation. Um, and that won't harm the tree as much. So a good healthy oak tree, for instance, that hasn't been hindered by much other problems in its life, especially if it's young and vigorous, will bounce, bounce back sometimes in as little as two, three or four weeks. Um, if you happen to blink in late June, early July, say you're not around your property or by your house, uh, I've known forest land owners that just didn't happen to walk through their properties um, at the time they were defoliated um, and never even knew that their trees were, were hit by gypsy moth because their trees were healthy at the time. They refoliated and looked almost 100% normal after they refoliate. If you look carefully, you could usually see the difference. You see a smaller leaves, uh, a smaller leaf coverage in the crown. So the crowns will look a little bit thinner, um, a little bit unhealthy to, to the eye of um, uh, the average person that uh, examines trees. It might not be clear as to what's wrong, but you could usually tell that something isn't quite right. Um, but to the average person that's not looking closely from a distance, they'll look 100% normal to them. And uh, a lot of times people will have their trees completely defoliated, never even realize it. And I know that's, I've, I've had that case in several different instances this year. So I know for as many calls as you may be getting already about gypsy moth, I don't think we see nothing yet. Um, and as spring progresses, uh, and people are getting outside more and more now with the warmer, warmer days. I think people are also going to start noticing their egg messes more and more too. Uh, so I expect uh, more and more uh, calls. I'm, I'm noticing an uptick on calls from the public about gypsy moth egg messes recently. And I think a lot of that has to do with people uh, getting outside a little bit more with this better weather and more closely examining trees, um, hiking more. Uh, noticing egg masses and uh, trees out in the forest and they're starting to um, you know um, just being around trees more often and examining them more closely or realizing something is not right. Some other really good sources on here um, I, I strongly encourage you to check them out especially that last one because the last one there is what do you do after your tree has been defoliated. Now this is that is an after the fact kind of holistic part treatment but this is also something that we could be doing in managing gypsy moss and any other insects. Uh, I'm sure the words uh, integrated pest management, IPM, or plant health care systems are, um, are at least uh, something you may have heard of or seen. Uh, I'm sure many of you master gardeners uh, apply some of these techniques yourselves or apply them very thoroughly, I'm willing to bet. Uh, but that's where you're not just approaching the, the problem. You're not just treating the symptom or the, the, the actual uh, problem insect, in this case, the gypsy moth, but you're treating the whole landscape. Um, you're treating, you know, trying to protect the soils and protect beneficial insects, uh, protecting all the resources, because we, we, we know that these are not closed systems that our trees are growing in. Uh, just as our gardens and garden plants are not growing in closed systems. Um, so the, the more we could look at everything like water management, um, good soil management, uh, good nutrient management, um, all those different factors can be effective. So the things that benefit trees like good mulching, um, uh, low deep uh, watering techniques like with a soaker hose or slow watering techniques, um, making sure you get deep penetration of the water in the root zone. That could be really effective, especially during dry parts of the year, especially if um, a tree has been defoliated. It's really going to be really dependent on uh, a good um, summer without drought periods. Uh, a drought could be particularly hard on a tree that's been defoliated over the summer. Um, fertilization. Um, one important factor with fertilizing for trees. Uh, trees don't require nearly the kind of fertilization and nutrient loads that uh, garden plants and a lot of herbaceous plants do. Um, and in fact, over fertilizing hardwood trees and softwood trees um, could actually be problematic, um, especially if you do it, you know, it's, um, around the same time that the tree has been uh, infested and damaged. Uh, most good arborists will tell you that it's never a bad time to fertilize and the best time to fertilize is when you can and when you can afford it. And that's true. But if you can wait until fall 
Um, so the dormant, the first dormant season after defoliation, that's best. Reason being, you don't want to create a big flush of new growth on trees that have just been stressed out. Um, you add a lot of nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium and other micronutrients to a tree's diet right after defoliation. It's going to inspire a lot of new root and shoot growth. Um, and that's more a material of the tree that the tree has to try to manage, maintain, and protect. So it's, uh, it's spreading its resources even thinner. So the stored carbohydrates, which are the tree's energy, you don't want to deplete that much more than it already has been. So ideally you wait till fall before applying the fertilizer. And then that fertilizer will help roots develop over the late fall. And then the tree to develop in the spring when that fertilizer is breaking down and available for the tree to get going in the early spring again. Um, and then perhaps follow up fertilization treatments the following year. Um, one last thing to note before uh, we start uh, talking about questions and then opening the conversation up is uh, um, most of our healthy trees and on years where there's not a lot of other stressors like drought, um, a single severe defoliation, and that being to the point where you have 50 to 60 percent of your normal crown and leaf surface being eaten by gypsum moss, um, which will cause the tree to will basically drop the remainder of its leaves and re-sprout. Those severe defoliation events, um, you know, could usually be handled by a hardwood tree once, uh, often twice, without much detriment. Um, sometimes a good healthy tree could be hit twice, two years in a row, severely defoliated, and you wouldn't notice much difference to the naked eye in preceding years, as long as the gypsum moth uh, outbreak goes away. Um, other trees, after that second defoliation, you're likely to see at least a little bit of decline, a little bit of dieback in the outer twigs and smaller branches. Uh, unhealthy trees are trees that are already suffering from other things and might actually um, decline severely or possibly die after a second defoliation, but that's going to be pretty rare. Um, after a third severe defoliation, if a gypsy mouth outbreak were the last three consecutive years, that's when you really start to see severe problems. Um, on a forest-wide level, on a tree-by-tree -tree basis, a lot of trees won't survive that. Uh, that's really tough and they won't necessarily die immediately. Um, it might be a slow death because ultimately, um, like a lot of other things in nature, um, the tree is weakened by the initial problem, the gypsy moth. And then it's actually that secondary pest or other problem, other stressor that winds up killing the tree. So what you might actually see after three severe defoliations is a slow dying of trees over the course of another three to five years. Um, so we might not see the full impacts of a gypsy moth outbreak for three or more years following the end of the outbreak. Um, we're hoping that this outbreak doesn't last that long. Sometimes a, uh, the population of gypsy moth just collapses um, and that has a lot of other factors that we can talk about in a moment, but I'm going to let Jan open the conversation back up, um, give everybody a chance to ask questions and I'll do my best to answer. Thanks, Gary. Yeah, this was great. So we did have one question in the chat and it was, can they kill a tree? And I think you've covered that pretty well, but I, I do want to add, um, so we've talked about them in, infesting spruce trees. Would one year of gypsy moth and spruce trees kill your spruce tree? Because I know spruces and evergreens don't come back as well as the, the broadleaf. Yeah, I'll have to give you that lovely answer, not answer kind of thing with the spruce trees. It, it's it's going to depend on how much defoliation occurs. And I don't know if there's an, an exact degree of defoliation that occurs. But if you see 90 to 100 percent defoliation, meaning 90 to 100 percent of the needles are removed from the tree, it is almost certainly a goner uh, with most conifers. Uh, there might be some conifers um, and I'm only taking a guess at this, like I know larch species or tamaracks and some others uh, sprout better from lateral shoots than a lot of other conifers do. Um, those conifers that once you remove the lower branches, you never see any green down there again. Um, those are species that are, are, are lacking the ability to um, re-sprout or send dormant buds back into active growth again. And so that's another reason that conifers and particularly conifers that can't do that suffer so strongly. Um, I would imagine there, there's a point and you could probably find that in literature where uh, a tree has a, a considerable chance of revival 
Um, so if you have a blue spruce or, or say a white pine or hemlock that gets hit, there's probably a point at which, and I'm guessing in the neighborhood of 40 to 50%, where it's still a reasonable chance of survival. Um, and then when it's, once you start getting up in the 75 to 90% range, um, your, your survival chance goes way down. Um, so if, you know, I would, what I would suggest is for folks to kind of make people aware of this as much as possible for gypsum moth in general, but especially conifers, if they're having a problem with the conifers, they got to act quick. Okay. Um, broadleaf hardwoods are, I wouldn't say that it's not necessary to jump on it right away, but in most cases, it's not necessary to jump on it right away. Um, you might even be able to get away with a good hard defoliation or two and still not have to worry about losing that tree. I personally want it subjected to that, but conifers, I really do believe if you want to be able to like have a good chance at sa saving the tree, you got to act quickly. Um, there are treatments that can be applied um, in later stages of attack, but some become, uh, some treatments like the BTK becomes useless at a certain point because the caterpillars have gone beyond that stage where it could really impact them or they've right. consumed so much of the tree already that it, by the time the BTK affects the insect, they've finished consuming the tree. Um, and so you're treating an insect after the tree's already been fully um, consumed. De defoliated, yeah. Um, yeah, that's, that's a good point. So Lucy had a question, is June the best time to ban the trunk? Yes. Or, uh, this, oh, go ahead. I was just going to say, are, are you... Are you waiting for them to reach a certain stage before you do the trunk banding? So, um, I'm sorry. What was the what was the person's? So, name? is June the best time to do the the trunk banding to capture those um, caterpillars moving up and down the tree? I do believe it is in June. Um, I, I will uh, disclose again that um, gypsy moth treatment management is pretty new to me, so I'm learning as I go here. Everything I've read suggests that, you know, in that month of June, um, that's going to depend on our individual season, of course. Um, if our if our spring continues the way it's been, um, it looks like we, I'm, I'm not 100% positive on this, but it looks like our growing degree days might be a little ahead and we might be a little bit early. So our hatch might be in April this year. Um, wow. Uh, late late April, um, but then it, it, we, maybe we'll get a cool down here and the growing degree day accumulation will slow down. So I guess um, that one web page, the USA National Phenology Network, I guess um, gives is a very interactive web page, and you can you can even get alerts. And I guess it's pretty accurate up to about six days in advance. So what we should be able to know, like using. Um, a resource like that is in, within six days of the actual uh, timing of the hatch. And then once you know the hatch, um, you could also kind of time with growing degree days when that when the caterpillars are going to reach their later instars. And I think it's around the fourth instar when they really start doing a lot of damage. Um, that's also around the same time that they start uh, descending from trees more often. And okay. uh, Unfortunately, I guess when, like I mentioned earlier, when we're having a bad year, the competition level is really high. The insects uh, sense that they don't leave the tree because they're afraid to, or, or, or just out of pure survival, they don't want to give their competition uh, the chance to eat that food while they're gone. Kind of like uh, when your dog has other dog visitors in your house, um, <laughs> they don't leave their bowl unattended <laughs> for good reason, right? right? Same concept with caterpillars in a tree. If there if there's a lot of competition, they, they might not descend the tree, and then that banding might not be nearly as effective. Um, so you might have to kind of explore some other tactics. Um, yeah, and the banding if they if you do the banding, you should monitor that and kill the gypsy moths every morning as they come back up or after you've collected them. So absolutely, that's a really good point, Jan. Um, if you're doing that burlap type banding, um, and I'm sure you could use other products besides burlap, but burlap's uh, apparently very effective for that, you know, they're using your burlap strapped to the tree as protection. Um, it's not going to trap them or kill them likely on its own. And some might get, you know, stuck in there by accident and expire, right. but most of them will get back out, climb back up your tree and go away. So if you just hang the burlap, you're not doing anything. Yeah, you um, have to monitor that. Exactly. And it's like, like I was saying with beans and Japanese beetles, 
if you're out there every day and uh, checking that religiously every day, chances are you're going to get a lot of them. Uh, if you let a couple days go by, you know, get tired and start spending less and less time at it, um, more and more Japanese beetles are going to, you know, attack your bean plants. You're going to have fewer and fewer beans. You might even lose a vine or two in the process. Um, I think you it's sound like you have some way. experience with that, Gary. <laughs> um, it's pretty new to me, and I'm not. I haven't been really good about researching and learning from other people. Uh, I I choose the approach of when it comes to gardening, and I like to um, not learn from other people's mistakes or <laughs> <laughs> uh, use good resources. I've I've learned the hard way on most of my stuff with, uh, yeah. and then discussing after I have a problem. Um, You'd think that a forester would know a little bit better, but I guess I'm just like everybody else. I get focused on my area of greatest concern, and then I learn the hard way, despite having lots of resources and people available to help you out. So I do yeah. talk you guys up a lot. Um, and well, I'm that's really, good. Thanks for I, the plug. I do. I really appreciate um, all these master gardeners and yourself, Jan that are willing to answer questions and help people out before and, and provide that advice based on what you've learned the hard way, what you've learned uh, through research and studies. Um, Cause man, once you learn the hard way yourself and realize you didn't have to, I mean, I might still do the same thing again next year and the year after that, but at least I know I'm in it, not smart. Doing right. That, you know, right. It's, you know, use, use people that, that are willing to help you and willing to share your expertise. And well, so that's why master, master gardeners, gardeners are thank here. You. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for volunteering. So I do want to mm -hmm. see if anybody else has any questions. And while we're waiting, I had one on the BTK, Gary, do you know, does it only affect gypsy moth caterpillars or does that affect any of our other native lepidoptera that might be in the forest at that time? It's a very good question, Jan. Uh, the, any lepidoptera, um, while feeding on BTK applied uh, leaf surfaces can become uh, damaged uh, or killed by BTK. Um, okay. It is not exclusive, um, but one of the good things about BTK, um, its efficacy, its, its duration in the environment when it's applied is that for the most part, there's, there's not an extensive number of other um, beneficial and native lepidoptera that are going to get treated and damaged in the mix along with gypsy moth. I'm not saying okay. that it won't happen, uh, but for instance, uh, if you're talking about monarch butterflies, um, you know, usually they're, they're consuming milkweed and, and uh, plants that develop later in the season. So they shouldn't have, like a monarch butterfly in theory should not be impacted at all by BTK application in April or early May um, or, or mid-June even, I don't think. Um, I could be wrong on that. Um, okay. If anybody Whoa. else knows differently, please tell me. All right, yeah. Hey, Sandy, you're not muted. Did you have a question? Sandy Brady, did you have a question? No. Okay, I'm going to mute you. Um, let me see. I've got a couple of chats here coming up. Oh, oh, from Nancy, as master gardeners, we have to advise what Cornell recommends. Where can we find that guidance? So Nancy, um, since you're not a Genesee County, I would check with your master gardener coordinator and see what resources they would want you to use with the public. Um, we do use a variety of things in Genesee County. And actually, we're going to have Brian Eschenhauer on in April, and he's our Cornell IPM person. So he will have some Cornell um, information for us to use. And I'm going to ask Gary to share that further information slide with me so I can actually send those links out to the Master Gardeners. Because I know that Arnold Arboretum one we've used in the past, and some of those other ones are also good resources to use. So... If there aren't any more questions, I want to thank Gary today. Um, this was excellent. And um, I hope we don't have an early hatch, but we will be helping Gary track in the helpline um, where questions are coming in about gypsy moss. And hopefully we can um, help the DEC figure out where we're having outbreaks. So we did give them our information last year and we're gonna to try to do a better job about it this year. So Gary, thank you so much. This was great. Um,
getting you some thanks. Great program in our chat here. So I see some hand clapping out there. So <laughs> thank you. May I say just one last thing, Jan? Sure. Um, and I know that uh, you sent some information forward to me this year. Um, what I found was an interesting spread all over Genesee or Orleans County from folks that and I collected some information from folks up in Orleans as well. Um, and it didn't really reveal a whole lot. But that information this year, I think, is going to be particularly helpful. And I apologize in advance. You're probably going to be sick and tired of reporting and, and communicating with me about gypsy moth. If, if, unless we get lucky and parasitoids and diseases uh, really affect the gypsy moth population, we're going to have gypsy moths coming out the ear. Yeah, um, I'm afraid so. Yeah. Yeah. Now, what's what's to, to be mentioned about it, too, is um, gypsy moth is kind of like a... Hurricane, hurricane, if you were to compare it to a weather event, it's kind of like a hurricane level landscape, but instead of wind covering that entire area, it's going to be like tornadoes so that, you know, you might have 10 square miles of pretty intensified impact and then skip several square miles and right. then see it again here and there. And then you might see it on your neighbor's lot and not have it on your side of the street. It's gonna be that kind of thing. Um, yeah. So even if it's really, really bad year, it's gonna be like that. You're not gonna see it across the board. Every, you're not You're not gonna be like, hey, everybody got an oak tree, you know, protect it. Um, if nobody does anything, a lot of those oak trees will be just fine. Right. Uh, but others will be absolutely devastated. It's gonna be that kind of like, oh my God, you know, tornado alley this time of year why did that tornado crush that poor person's house right and left that other person's house untouched it's that kind of thing um so a lot well, of people would be like what are you talking about gypsy moss and exactly and we like, were kind of we were kind of there last year because um i hardly saw any on my property and yet we had other people who had total defoliation of their trees and their yards so that really is, you were talking about the scraping of egg masses and things. And I think if you have a small yard and just a couple of trees, I think it's worth going out and checking and scraping those egg masses that you can reach and see just to reduce the number that are on your property, at least right. initially. So. And if anybody else has any ideas and wants to try anything of that nature, like uh, what they're doing in the Canandaigua watershed, I'm right. up, you know, I'll at least uh, consider it and give it a try if there if there's time and availability to do that, or whether it's this spring, this summer, uh, next spring, this coming winter. I'm hoping yeah. I'm all ears. I I'm hoping that this isn't a, a long term severe issue. Hopefully, it'll be just uh, every once in a while uh, an outbreak occurs and it it dies out in a year or two. Um, that does happen. So let's hope for the best and hope that's the case. Well, I do know one of the master gardeners shared some photos that she had taken of egg masses and it looked like quite a few of them had been parasitized already. So that's a good sign that the parasites are out there working or the parasitoids are out there working on them and that will help also reduce the numbers. So if, if nobody else has further questions, again, Gary, thank you so much. This was excellent. And the master gardeners who joined, thanks for joining. And I will be posting this to our YouTube page. So give me a couple of days and I'll send the link out to everybody. And um, Gary, thanks again. This was great. I'm going to, I'm going to stop the recording right now. You're welcome. Thank you. And thank you everybody.